Now, if, as you're able, if you would stand for the scripture reading. The first reading is from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The second reading is from John 15, verses 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is the word of God for the people of God. Carl Jung once said, hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. Slowing down in this hurry up life is not only useful, it's essential. I encourage you to have your, your compass guides and your bulletin handy. It does have questions uh, that you can reflect on this week, but it also has those places where you can jot down a few notes. Uh, something that the Spirit may be speaking to you today. So I encourage you to have those available throughout this message. Uh, but I'd ask you also to pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we, we come striving to hear your word. God, I ask that, that your word be heard above all else. That the words that I speak would no longer be my own, but they would be your words. Your words for your people. In Jesus' name, amen. So how do we slow down? How do we, how do we slow the pace of life? Or maybe the better question is, do you want to slow down? See, for many ways, our society has been advanced. 
And, and I, I see a deeper need in this advancement for, to find those quiet places, those spaces where we can truly reflect on God's wonderful design for us and for this world. You see, we have so many technological devices to make our lives easier and faster and more efficient and and more productive, but we still seem to be lacking something foundational. We're missing a deep understanding of our Creator or a relationship with God maybe is, is stagnant or worse yet, could be fading away. With all of the information that's around us, and the ease of access, we may begin to feel, scary as it is, that we have no need for God. And nothing can be further from the truth. But how do we get back? How do we get back to that place? And I think that we do this by an intentional focus on spiritual disciplines. This is one of the reasons that we have this Lenten series, Be Still, a Lenten journey of spiritual disciplines. You see, I hope that that through this series you're able to find one or more that resonate with you and that you can implement into your life, your faith journey. And so today I want to look at, at the discipline of Christian meditation. I want to explore what this is, what it's not, uh, how you can begin this discipline, and maybe a few forms that you can use, that you can practice. And I hope by the end that you'll have a better understanding of Christian meditation and maybe even a desire for it in your life. Like some of the other spiritual disciplines, meditation includes some of the other disciplines. We can see this in examples that Jesus gives to us. In his short years of ministry, Jesus was a busy man. He sought out many for for healing and teaching. He was desired for appearances everywhere. Jesus couldn't get away from the people as they would follow him everywhere he went. But it didn't stop Jesus from taking time to be alone with God the Father. We hear about times when, when Jesus would take time to go up the mountain to pray. He'd spend a little quiet time in a garden in conversation with God And of course, my favorite, he got out onto the boat to be alone. Certainly, this involved the spiritual discipline of prayer, but it could also have included meditation. Christian meditation is all about hearing the voice of God. It's about taking time to listen for the voice of God in your life, right where you're at today. Jesus tells us, that in order to do this, we need to abide in God. In our passage from John this morning, we hear this as Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. When we abide in Jesus, he in turn abides in us. When we abide in God, God abides in us. So when we abide in God, we are more apt to hear God's voice. Jesus tells us that if we abide in him and in his words, we can ask for anything and it will be done for us. But we must abide in him. Because there may be some confusion about Christian meditation, uh, let's be clear about what it is not. Christian meditation is, is not the practice of emptying our minds. Uh, We hear about this from from Eastern religions as the focus of this meditation is, is clearing a person's mind, attempting to find absolute peace, bliss, or nirvana. Christian meditation is the practice of filling your mind, filling it with the mind of God, an intentional focus on the glory of God. I mean, some will some will say that that's just too difficult. And I guess I can understand this as there are many times that I've tried, tried this and the, and the pace of life around me interferes with my focus. I don't know if you find that as well. I begin to think about what is on my to-do list, all those things that I forgot to do last week or what might be coming up next week. Truly this discipline 
is not difficult, but it takes practice. Some will say that this discipline is out of touch with today's world. In a space where time is a commodity and one that we should not waste a single minute, we feel that if we pause for just a moment, we're a failure. Society tells us that we should be constantly moving, constantly learning, constantly growing, and if we're not moving and doing something, even if we're on vacation, we're a failure. But I would say that this is just the reason to practice this discipline. It's countercultural, but but isn't that just what Jesus taught us? Was everything countercultural? We are to be in the world, not of the world. And finally, Christian meditation is not psychological manipulation. It's not something that, that we do with the intent to have, a, have these physical or psychological benefits. That's not the goal. The goal is to find the space where you can encounter the living God and hear that still, small voice. Now, meditation certainly may have some of those effects, some of those benefits, and they're going to be good, but, but they're not the full intention of this discipline of meditation. It's not about exploring our subconscious, but entering into a divine human encounter. It's about coming face to face with the living God. It's a desire to hear God's voice. Frederick Faber wrote this. He said, only to sit and think of God. Oh, what joy it is to think the thought, to breathe the name. Earth has no higher bliss. To be still. Now with all of this being said, we we really should give voice to something. We should give voice to the fear that might be residing within you at this moment. If the intention of Christian meditation is to encounter the living God face to face, it could bring with it a deep fear. How can I, as lowly as I am, ever think I would be worthy of being in the presence of the Almighty God? Wouldn't it be better if we could just go back to the time before Jesus walked this earth, back in the Old Testament, when when there was a mediator between the people and God? It was a priest between the people and God. Do I really want to be alone with God? What might happen? Will God see everything? Well, let me remind you that that God already sees everything. The psalmist reminds us with these words, Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I flee from your presence? Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book was writ, were written the days that were formed for me. One of my favorite psalms, Psalm 139. And just in case we feel that, that there may be a, a separation that we can get away from God, Paul reminds us that nothing will come between us and the love of God in his letter to the Romans. Because he says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing will separate us from Jesus Christ, our high priest. We have no need. We have no fear. We have no need of fear because God is a loving God and there is a desire for us to know God more. We have no mediator. We have direct access to the Father, to Jesus Christ. You see, upon the cross, uh, when that final moment came, the curtain in the temple which separated the holiest of holies, the inner temple, was torn in two. This opened the door for our direct relationship with God. Do not be afraid. So how do we accomplish this? How do we accomplish meditation? How do we go about beginning this discipline? 
I think first we need to understand that, that we learn by doing it. And so we learn to meditate by meditating. It may not be the greatest when you begin, but how often do we really begin anything as a master at it? It takes practice. It takes continuing in the discipline. I would suggest maybe beginning in prayer and then just abide in God. Abide in the very presence of God Almighty. Think about who God is, how God acts, how God loves, and allow God to speak to you right where you are. Be still and listen. With practice, you'll begin to, to find your inner silence. You'll, you'll learn to silence all of those things that are going on in your mind and truly focus on God. Maybe begin with short periods of time so that you don't get discouraged and then gradually increase that time that you spend in meditation. Just a, a couple of physical things for you uh, that, are, that are really important. Find a space where you can rest and meditate uninter uninterrupted. Remove all the distractions, whether it's TV, computers, tablets, definitely cell phones. Find a peaceful place, a nice chair, near a window, maybe a space with a direct sight of a picture of Jesus. Sit in a comfortable position, making sure that you're relaxed. And enter. Enter into the very presence of God. Center your entire being on God. Focus on, focus everything on your creator. Don't get discouraged if other thoughts come up first because I, I know that it'll happen. You'll learn how to keep them out in the long run. And so we've talked all about what Christian meditation is and is not and we've talked about how to begin meditating. We should talk a, lot about, a little bit about what we can meditate on. What are some of the forms of meditation? At first would be to me meditate on scripture. Instead of thinking of, uh, of studying Scripture like we talked a few weeks ago as a spiritual discipline or, or just trying to digest as much as possible, trying to read all the way through it really fast, meditation on Scripture involves chewing on shorter passages. It's taking time to reflect on how God is speaking to you at that moment in that particular passage, and it takes time. Now, some of you may... Uh, Tell me if I'm a little bit off on this, but I think of this as, as kind of a cow chewing on its cud. As it, the cow brings up previously digested food for more chewing, more digesting, which allows them to receive the most nutrients out of the food. Meditation on Scripture allows us to chew the cud of the Word, mulling it over, discerning what God is saying through all of these passages. When we do this, you see, we internalize and personalize the verses. This takes time and it takes focus, just what we have in meditation. Another form is, is recollection or recollection. It's a, it's a time to be still and bring all the fragments in our mind and become centered. Give up all those things that we are stressing about and place them all before the Lord. Then receive the direction of God while you spend the remaining time in silence, listening for God's voice. You can also meditate on, on creation. If you're near a window or maybe outside, you can gaze upon a tree, a flower, or sunrise, or a freshly planted field. And turn all your focus on that one thing. Allow creation to speak to you. Take it all in and hear God speak of his love for you and all of creation. <coughs> Bless you. And lastly, you can meditate on events of our time. What has happened in the world around you today? What events have happened in your personal life today? Take those moments and spend time reflecting on, on where God was in those situations. Where was God in, in your daily life? And also listen for that voice nudging you and directing you to possible action as you reflect on it. So once again, Christian meditation is, is not about clearing your mind, but about filling it with all that is God. It is a way of life. 
It's a discipline that'll, that'll help us to grow in our relationship with God and will help us to hear God's voice in this dark and noisy world. And so let me leave you with, with just a, a quick story of Elijah and how he was able to hear and discern God's voice. You see, Elijah hears that, that Jezebel wants to kill him and he escapes up the mountain where he is fasting and meditating and praying. And he wants to hear God's voice, God's direction. So he waits. And here is where he waits for God to pass by. But as he waits for God to pass by, there's a rush of wind. But God wasn't in the wind. There was a great earthquake, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a great fire. But God wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, there was a low whisper. Some will say that it might have been the sound of sheer silence. It was then that God spoke to Elijah. How often do we look to the wind, to the earthquakes, even fires for the voice of God, but don't find it? How often do we ask for a big sign, a booming voice to speak to us? How often do we probe the depths of silence? Because sometimes that's where the voice of God is. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we we hear you speak to us. Not necessarily in loud voice, and the noise that's around us. But we hear you in the silence. When we're able to slow down, pause, and reflect on you. And so God, I ask that you help us to do that. Help us to meditate on you. On all the things that you have for us. Help us to hear your voice. Pray for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.